Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionalis continuing our playlist, our series of lectures about rheumatology. We have discussed rheumatoid arthritis and the treatment approach. Today we'll focus on steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. With that being said, now let's get started. Treatment for rheumatoid, medical or surgical, medical non-steroidals, DMARDs, and other steroids are here. Non-steroids are here. So, as you know, anti-inflammatory are divided into steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Then we have the DMARDs, and these are synthetic or biological. Methotrexate is synthetic. Sulfasalazine is synthetic. Hydroxychloroquine is synthetic. Liflunamide is synthetic. Anti-inflammatory drugs, steroidal anti-inflammatories, and non-steroidals or NSAIDs. We have aspirin and other NSAIDs. And among the other NSAIDs, we have non-selective cyclooxygenase 1 and 2 inhibitors. And we have the selective cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors, such as the famous celecoxib. I have a table comparing aspirin with other non-steroidals and another table comparing non-selective and selective non-steroidals on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash medicosis. I've explained the arachidonic acid pathway before, but in brief, membrane phospholipid into arachidonic acid thanks to phospholipase A2. Who inhibits this? Steroids. If you have arachidonic acid, you have two pathways, prostaglandin or leukotrienes. Here we have the cyclooxygenase. Here we have the lipooxygenase. What's the function of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug? To destroy this. Let phospholipase A2 speak about himself. I set the arachidonic acid free from the tyranny of the membrane phospholipid. I let arachidonic acid lose to promote my agenda of inflammation. However, steroids can send me to the cleaners. That's why steroids are very powerful anti-inflammatory drug because they destroy the arachidonic acid and it's two pathways. And doctors, when they don't know what to do next, they give you steroids. And in most cases, you improve. You know why? Because of the inflammatory mediators. So if you give the patient steroids, no phospholipase A2, no arachidonic acid, no prostaglandin G2, E2, F2-alpha, and no leukotrienes, no prostaglandin H2 or prostaglandin D2. So yeah, like... Whatever the disease is, probably one of these are involved when you give steroids. Even though you don't, you don't know what's causing the problem, it's probably gonna help. I'm not saying that you should treat the patient without knowing what's going on, but I'm just describing the reality of our world. So, steroids inhibit the phospholipase A2, prevent the formation of arachidonic acid. Non-steroidals inhibit the cyclooxygenase, prevent the formation of prosta glandins including all of these so prostaglandin e2 fever ew because it's painful and then f2 alpha so here we have cyclooxygenase 1 leading to thromboxin e2 thromboxin pro-coagulation pro-platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction cyclooxygenase 2 on the other hand produce prostaglandin i2 also known as prostacycline which keeps the blood cycling this is pro-coagulation, this is anti-coagulation. How is this anti-coagulation? Vasodilation preventing platelet aggregation. Aspirin is very similar to non-steroidals. It inhibits the cyclooxygenase, except aspirin is more anti-platelet. Non-steroidals are more analgesic anti-inflammatory. Kind of a pearl for my pros. Cyclooxygenase 1. What's unique about cyclooxygenase 1 is that it protects the stomach lining from the inside, from your acid. Number 2. It promotes platelet. Big time. Why? Because it promotes the production of thromboxin A2. Thromboxin A2 is pro-platelet aggregation and blood clotting and all of this stuff. Glucocorticoids, also known as steroids, also known as the magic, the wonder. No, the wonder drug is aspirin. Oh, let's call them magic. Ignorant doctor saver. I just call it call them this way. Why? Because when your doctor is ignorant and give you steroids, uh, so saved his day. Okay. Naturally made in your adrenal gland, the zona fasciculata, and this is the difference between cortisol with with an L and cortisone with an N. 
The one with an L is the one from your adrenal gland, and the one with an N from the outside world. When you give you, when we give you medicine or give you drugs, cortisone, not cortisol. Just a tiny difference. What's the mechanism of action of steroids? A lot, including inhibiting phospholipase A2, no arachidonic acid, no leukotriene, therefore no asthma. Inhaled glucocorticoids are good for asthma patients. No arachidonic acid, no prostaglandins, therefore no fever, no inflammation, no pain, no gain. Actually, there is gain. There is weight gain with glucocorticoids. Ha <laughs> ha. I mean, uh, not funny. It's just a mnemonic. They inhibit genes that encode, because genes code for protein, that code for the cytokines. Cytokines are proteins, of course. As you know, cytokines are involved in rheumatoid arthritis pathophysiology. When you inhibit the gene that code for those proteins called cytokines, you have inhibited the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. Bingo! That's why we use glucocorticoids for rheumatoid. All right. Aminosuppressants. They suppress what? The hemoral immunity by B lymphocytes. And as you know, B lymphocytes secrete what? Antibodies, including the O2 antibodies. When you suppress the B lymphocytes, no O2 antibodies, no rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. Brilliant. Cell-mediated immunity by the T lymphocytes. And as you know, T lymphocyte is involved in rheumatoid arthritis. So this is good news. But there are also bad news. Like what? When you suppress your immunity, you are at higher risk of infections. Also, those steroids damage your bone through osteoclasts, and when they damage your bone, you, it's, it's horrible. Because in life, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Glucocorticoid use in rheumatoid arthritis. First, we'll talk about systemic steroids, then we'll talk about intra-articular steroids. So, glucocorticoid bridge, I've told you before. Steroids, rapid onset DMR, slow onset. So, you start, you diagnose rheumatoid, you start both of them at the same freaking time. Steroids will work right away, but then DMARDs will take weeks or months in order for the onset to occur. In between, we have a bridge so that the patient can have treatment for the symptom. You don't wait just for the DMARDs because this can take like three months. You'll leave the rheumatoid patient with rheumatoid symptoms for three months. Shut up! So what should I do? You bridge it with glucocorticoids. If you want to maintain the patient for a long time on steroids, give the low dose for disease control chronically or for a long time. But if there is a flare, severe extraarticular manifestation, give high dose steroids. What do you mean by severe extraarticular manifestation? Like pericarditis, necrotizing scleritis, which can perforate your sclera. Horrible stuff. These steroids can manage acute flares. They are major anti-inflammatory and anti-immunity. They are immunosuppressants. May help chronically if the patient has inadequate response to DMARDs. So some patients don't respond to DMARDs. We give them steroids. And since we'll use them chronically, please give the low dose. Don't be stupid. Try not to give steroids long term as much as you can. If you did, very low dose. But as a general rule, not to give steroids long term. Why? Because steroids can lead to this osteoporosis. And a rheumatoid arthritis patient can already suffer from osteoporosis thanks to the pathophysiology of the rheumatoid arthritis itself. Don't add fuel to the fire for a long term like an idiot. Get your head out of your sphincter. How to prevent, prevent glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis? Try bisphosphonate. How to manage glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis? Denosumab, and I've talked about this in my video about the rank and the rank ligand. Denosumab is a monoclonal antibody against the rank ligand. And you can use teriparatide, which is a parathyroid hormone analog. Beautiful. We're done with the systemic steroids. Let's talk about the local intraarticular steroid injection. First, you rule out septic arthritis. Why? Because first, septic knee can mimic rheumatoid arthritis knee, or not just the knee, any joint. Second, steroids make infection worse. Remember, they are immunosuppressants, so please make sure that this is not septic. How do I know? You need a physical exam, you need a history, and of course, you need to tap and aspire the joint and send it to the lab. If it's septic, 
the white blood cell count in the joints are gonna be more than 75,000. That's how we know if it's septic and of course it's a medical emergency, especially in kids. When should you use intraarticular steroids? If the patient has only few joints involved in cases of rheumatoid, you can give injection into these joints. But if the patient has like um, 11 joints involved in rheumatoid arthritis, are you gonna inject 11 joints? Are you stupid or what? What kind of a steroid do you use for intraarticular injection? Usually triamcinolone. Please do not give steroid intraarticular injections more than five times a year. Stop it. Side effects of not the systemic but the intraarticular steroids. Arthropathy can cause aseptic necrosis of the bone. Remember the osteoclast? Infection, tendon rupture, feet, ankle swelling, bleeding into joint, allergic reactions, weakening of bone. Remember osteoclast activation. Please watch my video on rank and rank ligand. Available in my hematology playlist. Non-steroidals are aspirin and other non-steroidals. Those non-steroidals, including aspirin, do provide symptomatic relief. They do decrease pain. They do decrease inflammation. But they cannot modify the disease. They do not alter the course of the disease. They are incapable of achieving remission. This is the job of the DMARDs, right? What if I had a patient allergic to aspirin? Give non-acetylated non-steroidals. Why? Because you know aspirin is known as acetyl, acetyl salicylic acid. So if they are allergic to aspirin, please don't give acetyl. Try the non-acetylated non-steroidals. I have a great comparison table between aspirin and other non-steroidals available at patreon.com forward slash medicosis. Also, I have another table between selective and non-selective, let's do it here, COX inhibitors, also available on Patreon. Please go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis. Thank you so much in advance. Thank you for putting food on my table. Thank you for helping me produce more content in the future. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Caution. Number one. Steroids plus non-steroids increase your risk of peptic ulcer disease slash gastritis because both of them inhibit the cyclooxygenase 1. It's history now. No one is gonna protect your nice stomach. Why don't I just like keep giving steroids and non-steroids together and then add mesoprostol to protect the stomach lining? Okay, you're known as an idiot. Let's say that A is causing B. In this case, A is the combination of steroid and steroids leading to B, which is apeptic ulcer disease. Okay, I don't know, if you want to treat B, shouldn't you just like inhibit A, because A leads to B? But I can like keep A producing B and then add C from the outside. Why? You just want to waste resources and you're an idiot. Caution, always taper the steroid use gradually. Now, why that? Let me tell you a story. The story of the adrenal gland. Okay, so adrenal gland produces what? Produces steroids, especially cortisol. All right, got it, okay. Now you're taking steroids from the outside. So your adrenal gland will say, well, you know what? No one needs me anymore. I'll shut down the production of steroids because you're taking steroids from the outside. So what's the use? Now we are a stupid doctor who stopped the steroids from outside immediately, suddenly. Ooh. Now, nobody has told the adrenal to get ready to start producing cortisol again. This can lead to adrenal shock or an acute adrenal insufficiency. We want to tell the adrenal slowly, step by step, please, we need you to produce cortisol. We need you to produce cortisol. We need you to produce cortisol. So you taper the steroid use gradually. And believe it or not, glucocorticoids are very important for your body if you remember your physiology. Beware, all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs increase your risk of cardiovascular events such as MI, stroke, sudden death, and heart failure. Why? Because they can lead to thrombus. Therefore, do not give non-steroidals to patients with a history of recent MI or cabbage. 
which is known by the public as open heart surgery. Check out my new website called medicosisperfectionalist.com. I have premium courses such as the electrolytes course and believe it or not, the antibiotics course. Please subscribe and hit the bell to get notified. Click on the join button to join the tribe. Follow me on all of these platforms and thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist where medicine makes perfect sense.